give you a sense of what that's like. Like inside these mist shrouded rainforest covered beautiful mountains in central Mexico are cave systems that go from top to bottom. So sinkholes on the top of the mountain drain rainfall all the way through the mountain, depositing it out in canyonways below that serve rivers. Um, if I slice that mountain open, you'd see a map uh, plan something like this. This actually represents 53 miles of passages, 25 different entrances, and 1,560 vertical meters of passageway. So you'd be going in through holes in the top of the mountain, rappelling downward, going through waterfalls, crawling through canyonways inside the mountain and going deeper and deeper and deeper until you reached a place where you could go no further unless you went diving. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I come home at the end of the weekend and I don't even feel like, you know, taking the tanks out of the back of the car. But if you're diving in this place, you would need to lay two miles of rope just to get to the dive site. So when your tank needs to be filled, when you get out of the water, that tank has to go back up the inside of the mountain, up two miles of rope to get filled. So in 95, when we went, we thought, well, let's see if we can work um, from the bottom up. So we hiked down the mountain, established a base, camp, so down about 6,000 feet, um, and then we wanted to work our way into the mountain from a place called the Resurgence, where the water spills out of the mountain and fills a river. And in 94, the water had been quite clear, like this shot here, but when we got there in 95, it was pretty muddy. There'd been landslides in the mountain just absolutely obliterating the visibility of the river and the cave water. So we did manage to do some pretty significant exploration, but it was really hard to do a good job mapping the cave. So at the end of the project, we sat around the campfire and brainstormed, and the expedition leader, Dr. Bill Stone, had an idea, and it was an idea about how we could map a cave even if we couldn't see it. So even if we couldn't see through the murky water, he had an idea about how we would map that. And I recognized around that campfire that there we were, a bunch of very different people, but all very open-minded, versatile, adaptable, willing to do just about anything to make an expedition a success. And these were the kinds of people that I wanted to work with. These were the kinds of people that made good explorers. And around that campfire, Bill told us that we needed two years and about $750,000 in order to build the device that he had in mind for mapping a cave, whether we could see it or not. And two years later, we pulled it off. So two years later, we were in North Florida in a place called Wakulla Springs, back again with the United States Deep Caving Team, this time preparing to make the world's first accurate subterranean three-dimensional map. So what you're seeing here is me driving this mapping device, and it's got a sonar array on it that bounces signals off the walls of the cave and gathers up the measurements um, that it takes in the process. Now, it was a pretty ambitious project for the mid-90s because this was also the first time that we had really used rebreathers to such a degree for such long-range exploration efforts. We had to build a pretty aggressive um, infrastructure in order to manage these dives. To give you a sense of the dives that we were doing, um, the cave is just about 300 feet deep, and we were doing bottom times of about five hours, which means after five hours at 300 feet deep, you've got about 17 hours of decompression. And so we decided early on in the project that we would probably want to be wearing two rebreathers. So two rebreathers plus um, a, a mapper or a scooter that we're driving through the system. We're dragging another vehicle with us just in case the first one breaks down and heading off into the planet for these super long missions. 
So for me, my longest mission on this uh, project was about 22 hours long. But one of the coolest things from this project was another piece of technology, uh, ultra low frequency radio beacons, where we could broadcast our position from inside the earth back to the top side so that our friends could track us through whatever landscape that we passed beneath. So in this case, they're just tracking us through a field, but they had to get into canoes and paddle through swamps. And at other times, working with the same team, I have cave dived underneath golf courses, a bowling alley, an elementary school, an industrial park, and even a Sunny's barbecue restaurant. So the result of this project was that we could definitively show people with precision where these large drinking water conduits were beneath our feet and how they were related to things that were topside. Now since that time, like 25 years ago, um, Bill has continued to develop his uh, mapping device and uh, make it even better. And today the mapper is actually artificially intelligent and it can now run without a tether and without me driving it. So it can drive through the caves, scan as it goes, and create um, detailed, accurate, three-dimensional maps of the cave that it explores. And when it turns around to conserve fuel and come back, it can pick other places to map along the way to fill in the details of its map. And now we're using this with um, Bob Ballard, as you see in that shot there, um, in caves in California. And um, the, the mapper's also been underneath the ice in Antarctica, in the Arctic, uh, Namibia, and many other places. But its eventual destination is to map the liquid oceans underneath the frozen surface of Jupiter's moon Europa. So this cave diver is destined for space. So it's amazing to think that this all, you know, started really around a campfire in the middle of Mexico with something that we perceived as a problem. But explorers are leaders and we're ready to step into the darkness to try something new. In 2000, uh, my colleague uh, Wes Giles and I pitched a project that was completely new to National Geographic when we told them that we wanted to be the first people to cave dive inside an iceberg. We wanted to go to Antarctica and intercept the B-15 iceberg, which was the largest iceberg ever recorded on Earth. In fact, it was the largest moving object we've ever seen on our planet. And this iceberg was the size of Jamaica. And we hypothesized that there would be caves, cracks, crevices, things that we could swim into to get inside the iceberg. So we pitched to National Geographic that we would make a journey from New Zealand 12 days across the Southern Ocean to intercept uh, this ice and um, try and be the first people to cave dive inside an iceberg. Now, there were a lot of hazards, like the one you just saw, which was uh, that the ship would get coated with ice and we'd have to beat it off with baseball bats and hammers. In fact, just traveling in the pack ice is incredibly dangerous. Um, it's hard to navigate through. You could rip the hull open with the ice and you can also get trapped in the ice. And that's nothing compared to actually cave diving inside icebergs, which turned out to be an incredibly dangerous proposition. The ice moves, it cracks, it calves, and we discovered that there were ferocious currents inside the ice. But there were also remarkable life forms and opportunities for us to explore an environment that had never been documented before. And again, that was a huge privilege to be able to take on. And during the course of this project, um, I would say we had some pretty close calls um, from the ice itself and learned a lot in the process. Um, and you know, some would even say at times that you know, we were concerned that we hadn't achieved everything that we wanted to achieve. I mean, you could even call that failure. Like we were trapped inside this iceberg and literally hours after I shot this photograph and was getting ready to get back in and dive again, the entire iceberg 
that we had just been inside of completely broke apart. So yeah, the iceberg cave we'd just been inside of literally exploded like as if you dropped an ice cube in a drink in a hot summer day. But I, I learned from that project about resiliency and about how nothing really is a failure. Everything that happens in your life informs the next decision you make. And so I, I like to think of failure as discovery learning. It's one step forward to do something better next time. Now, in terms of scientists, I also work uh, quite a bit with biologists who are interested in the life that's swimming inside of underwater caves. Life that's quite unique because it doesn't need photosynthesis. It lives its entire life cycle in the blackness of an underwater cave. These animals have no eyes, they have no pigment, but they do have other very interesting sensory organs that help them to survive, thrive, and hunt in their environment. Um, here is a creature called Remipede, one of my very favorite underwater um, cave adapted animals. This guy actually has venomous fangs and pincers and can attack something 30 times its size, neutralize it, turn its guts into jello and suck the life out of its prey over time. And these very small but interesting organisms that are, um, they actually predate the extinction of the dinosaurs, they have not changed or evolved in over 65 million years. And yet we find them in some very young caves like this one in Bermuda. This cave in Bermuda might be 100 to 150,000 years old, but we find these very ancient critters inside the cave. We don't know how they got there. Uh, we don't know, you know why they haven't evolved or changed in so long. It's just one of the many interesting questions um, that we have. And in 2011, Noah invited us to Bermuda to um, not just dive in the caves on top of Bermuda, but to go deeper down the flank of Bermuda, down the wall, to see if we could find the signs of former sea level stands and to see if we could find places that might represent ancient um, uh, caves and um, places where waves might have crashed against the shoreline. In fact, um, while the last photo was about 370 feet deep and my colleague Tom Eiliff was collecting some samples, this is about 440 feet deep and uh, we're looking at a place where the sea would have crashed on an ancient shoreline. For these dives, again, we use rebreathers um, because it's so deep and that gives us much more range. And um, this is all my equipment before I pick up the camera and the lights. Um, we're working in two-man teams and, uh, and then a, a safety team uh, connects up with us when we get to about 130 feet deep on our decompression schedule on the way back up. In Bermuda, if you've ever traveled to Bermuda, you might know that there are no rental cars. So traveling around is kind of interesting. We use uh, scooters and we borrow one vehicle and shuttle a lot of gear in whatever way we can. We run into the same problem in, in Cuba, but fortunately in Cuba, um, they're very accustomed to picking up hitchhikers. <laughs> Love this picture. But as explorers, we're collaborators, we're creative, and we're able and willing to connect people and ideas. I also work with um, archaeologists and paleontologists in many different locations. And let me show you um, what these caves are kind of like. Uh, this is a cenote in the middle of the uh, Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. A cenote is the Mayan word for well. They have no surface rivers in this part of Mexico. All the water drains beneath the surface in underground rivers. And what you're looking at here is the underside of a drinking water well. So the bright light at the very top center is um, actually a hole in the bottom of a drinking water well. We have a metal pipe coming down from the ceiling there uh, to gather up this nice fresh drinking water. 
And if you look below the pipe at the bottom of this picture, what we're interested in here is this mound of debris um, that represents everything that's fallen through the hole or fallen from the ceiling itself. And as we travel down that debris mound, it's almost like going back in time. We find modern garbage, we find things like these cattle skulls. Um, here's a very interesting cow skull. This one has silver teeth. So uh, we think that this is actually something that tells a real story of the drought in Mayan times. So when um, times got tough, water supplies got scarce, the Mayan people moved out of the larger cities and population centers like Chichen Itza. And as they left, they took their belongings, their family, their um, livestock, and their valuables. And they had to hide their precious things somewhere. And we think that maybe they thought that applying their silver or gold to the teeth of their cattle might be a great place to hide valuables. Keep the mine safe. If we travel down that mound, we find also you know, Spanish colonial water carrying vessels and even um, Mayan pottery that might have been used for funerary practices. And we also find the remains of the Mayans themselves that would have been probably ritually placed here as part of um, sacrifice rituals. On the left, you're looking at a, a Mayan skull. And on the right, you're actually looking at a Lucayan Indian skull in the Bahamas. And in the past, we used to um, retrieve these important items for paleontologists to study. Um, once they had a permit, which was very hard to get, we would bring these objects to them topside, and then it would take a Herculean effort to conserve them um, so that they, they um, didn't deteriorate. They do very well underwater in the anoxic um, cave water. But some objects are impossible to retrieve because they're actually really part of the cave themselves. Like this is the um, skeleton of an extinct sloth in a cave in Cuba. And what we do today is rather than bringing the skull of the sloth out, we actually scan it in its location so that we don't damage it or, um, or even you know, move any of the silt that's overlaying it. So we scan it underwater and bring the data out of the cave now. Or in some cases, we even scan entire um, shelves or entire you know, passageways um, so that we can show an archaeologist or paleontologist where a skull lies beside a rock, beside a piece of wood, beside a piece of pottery or another artifact um, that's important to their work. And so that way, everything remains in better condition and more people have access to the data. These are both um, uh, actual uh, scans as opposed to photographs in various stages of, of their completion. Um, so it's very, very high resolution, 80,000 data points per square inch. And my colleague, Corey Jaskolsky, um, has created this proprietary software that delivers the highest resolution available in scans today. It's, it's so compelling that we're actually able to use these scans with um, this device. This is, this is actually several years old now. This is a beta version of the Microsoft HoloLens that allows people to see holographic reproductions of things that we've scanned. So here is what you would see if you were wearing the HoloLens. This is an Ice Age bear skull from the cave that's right behind it. That's a real cave behind it. Only the bear skull and this table are holographic and they're slightly see-through so that you can tell the difference. Um, so these are very, very compelling reproductions that allow people to have a fully interactive experience um, with what we found. And that means that we can also put the HoloLens on um, our guides and allow them to see um, what we're seeing underwater. They never have to go diving and they can see the remains of their ancestors. So the HoloLens technology is something that's going to be ubiquitous in the future. I mean, imagine you could wear these in a scuba classroom and watch someone demonstrating a fin pivot right before you in the classroom. 
or you could be underwater and ask for a reef map and follow a reef map around or just follow a map to the closest bathroom in the building that you're in. So amazing technology. Um, this, uh, this particular cave I'm about to show you here in the Bahamas is probably my favorite cave in the world and it's because it's so beautiful, uh, Dan's Cave. Uh, and this cave was formed when there was no water in it. So water um, from rainwater soaked into the ground, dripped from the ceiling to the floor in this formerly dry cave and deposited all these incredible formations, one drip of water at a time. Sort of like if you um, drip candle wax in a pile. Now these caves have been dry at three different times during Earth's history. And we know this because we find literally formations on top of formations on top of formations. So three different times when ocean levels were significantly lower, new formations happened. And part of the reason we know that is because of everything that you see in this photo that's orange or red. Because this material is actually dust from the Sahara Desert. Now this cave is in the Bahamas on the opposite side of the Atlantic Ocean. But the dust from the Sahara Desert during dry epochs on planet Earth will blow up into the atmosphere, cross the Atlantic Ocean, rain down on the surface, soak into the ground, and then deposit itself in layers inside the cave that then become trapped underneath future cave formations. So here, the Red Sahara dust is trapped inside this calcite formation. And working with um, Peter Swart from the University of Miami, we have removed some critical speleothems, they're called, brought them out for Peter so he can cut them open and look for the layers of that Sahara dust inside the formations and then count back in time. And in doing so, he has learned that this cave, Dan's cave, is about 350,000 years old. So pretty remarkable. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I am broadcasting to you from Canada, where I live. And so I want to share with you a little bit about um, what we see here diving in Canada. If I start on the East Coast, we dive on some pretty remarkable shipwrecks in Newfoundland. And these shipwrecks were sunk in 1942 by German U-boats. In this case, you're looking at a defensive um, stern gun on one of these vessels. And uh, the vessel was actually carrying iron ore from a mine on uh, Newfoundland's Bell Island. And that iron ore was used for building ships in World War II. So the Germans thought that if they sunk these vessels carrying the iron ore, that this might disrupt some of the shipbuilding efforts and maybe turn the tide of the war. So not very many people know that uh, German U-boats were actually firing torpedoes and sinking ships in what is now Canada and uh, in even striking uh, a loading wharf on the Bell Island um, mining operations. Now we also dive inside the mine itself because the mine is, is now flooded um, with water and can follow the what I call the industrial archaeology. So we can see this is a pumping mechanism that would have been used to dewater the mine when it was used um, to, to mine iron. And uh, we follow these pipes that would have been used for dewatering or for running pneumatic drills. And, um, and then we find some pretty interesting inscriptions on the walls too. Um, this inscription um, this little caricature of a head um, with the name James Bennett was painted with um, soot from the miner's cap lamp. And uh, I think that's, that's pretty interesting. We also find some more ominous inscriptions. Um, you can see here a little white cross on the wall. And that is a location where a miner would have lost his life. 106 men lost their lives working in this mine. And in this particular passage, you can almost see beneath the silt that there is a little railway there. So iron ore carts would have run down that railway on a slope and he was probably hit by one of these ore carts in the dark. Now if we go over to the west coast of Canada, I love going there to dive with the stellar sea lions and the California sea lions because they're pretty curious and really, really fun. When you jump in the water, they come galloping over to you like a pack of puppies. 
Uh, but pretty soon you realize you're in for more than that. It's almost like um, being in the middle of a bar fight because <laughs> these guys are curious and orally fixated. They'll, they'll bite, nibble, they'll grab things, they'll steal your fins, they'll bring a rock or an urchin or a shell to you and toss it to you, wanting you to throw it back. They'll even steal your bubbles, swim around and bring them back and spit them in your face. Um, so they're, they're pretty curious. I've never been injured by one, but I have had a dry suit punctured by a young one's um, rather sharp uh, teeth when he grabbed onto my, my shoulder. And I've had them steal my buddy's fins before, so it's pretty entertaining. Now, if you dive out west in British Columbia, you also have a chance to dive on wrecks that are also really, you know, beautifully adorned with sea anemones and all kinds of life. And pretty much everything is encrusted with colorful life in British Columbia. Um, this is uh, Puget Sound king crab. And it almost seems to me like nothing has any fear of you. Um, it's really, really a great place to dive. And everything is covered with color. These are strawberry anemones and even the sea urchins are colorful and beautiful. Uh, some of my most adventurous diving in Canada is in the far north in the Arctic uh, with walruses here and even with polar bears. So in shooting a film in the last couple of years, I was asked to jump in the water and uh, get in with polar bears and try and get some shots uh, for the film. And I think that's probably one of the most dangerous things that I have ever done. And I don't know if I'll do it again. This is the last thing you see as you're, you know, desperate trying to get the gas out of your wing to descend and get a shot beneath the polar bear as he swims over top of you. Um, these guys are pretty huge. Like that's a paw print beside my hand there, uh, pretty much full screen. And we're actually diving out of a canoe. So the polar bear is uh, just about as big as the canoe. And if he wanted to, he could get in it in a second. In this part of the Arctic, we're actually camping out in a little hut, me, five guys in a 10 by 10, and we're all fighting for uh, one plug to the generator. <laughs> we each have about 24 inches wide of living space, but it's worth it for those amazing marine mammals, but also for the beautiful, colorful life that we see on the seafloor, because um, if I didn't tell you that the water was, was uh, 28 degrees Fahrenheit, you might look at these pictures and think that this looks pretty tropical. It's really, really beautiful. As you look down, you'll see sea anemones. And as you look up, you might be at the base of a beautiful giant iceberg. You look really hard at about the bottom third of this photo, you'll see a very tiny diver, my dive buddy, way above me. So the ice itself is really beautiful to dive around. Uh, as I was saying, I shot a movie called Under Thin Ice. It has not aired in the US yet. It will come to you sometime this year, but you can get a free app online called Discover the Arctic. It's on Google Play and on the App Store for free. And it follows our journey, has some cool video footage and a lot of great information about um, polar bears, narwhals, belugas, all kinds of cool animals and climate change. And if you're looking for something to keep the kids busy for a couple hours, put them on, discover the Arctic. <laughs> They'll have quite a lot of fun with it. Um, but for me, I grew up in the Great Lakes in Canada, in this area here called Tobermory, where we have literally hundreds of beautiful, fairly intact wooden shipwrecks, a couple hundred years old. There's 6,000 shipwrecks in the Great Lakes, so plenty to discover. Uh, when I started diving, the viz was really, really bad in the Great Lakes, but now the zebra mussels, the little crusty things that you see on the side of this wreck, have actually filtered the Great Lakes to the point where the water is quite clear. It's not good for the ecosystem, but it's great for uh, seeing these amazing wrecks and just the beautiful, beautiful scenery. Uh, where I live right now, near Ottawa, this is my backyard. <laughs> this is my uh, my river. And uh, fortunately, the ice has 
just cleared out. Um, in fact, I think the last of the ice we saw in the woods just a few days ago. And uh, I'll be ready to jump back in liquid water soon. Now, in all of this stuff that I do, I know when I speak to kids, the number one question that they have for me is, aren't you afraid? And I like to tell everyone, but, but especially young kids, that, um, yeah, you know, explorers are not fearless. Um, I am scared whenever I go diving, and I want to dive with other people that are also scared. Because if you're scared, it means that you care about the outcome. It means that you understand that you're taking a risk, and you choose to do something about it. So um, fear is natural and normal. Ultimately, you know, we are the sum of all of our experiences in life. The good, the bad, the frightening, terrifying things that happen inform who we are and who we become. We can't change our past. We can't change the things that others might term as failures, um, but we can change what we do with those experiences, using them for discovery learning. So when I talk to kids, I like to encourage them to, you know, even if they'll never dive, even if they'll never be a cave diver, I encourage them to step into the darkness and do something that scares them a little bit. Because I think in that space, you know, that's where they have the opportunity to, you know, stand on the threshold and do something that scares them a little bit um, and gives them the opportunity to become an explorer. And for, you know, me, that opened the doors to maybe not being an astronaut, but certainly um, becoming an aquanaut. And that has enabled some really exciting opportunities in my life. So I hope you enjoyed a few of those visuals and, uh, and I'd be happy to answer some questions for you. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh, if anybody has questions, go ahead and type them. I've got a couple of them to start with. Um, okay, so one of the conversations we have with folks pretty frequently is do you do do I want to go back to a place that I loved or do I want to try someplace new with you as an explorer? What is your mm -hmm. belief? Do you always go someplace new or do you have some place you want to go back to over and over again? Oh, I, a bit of both, really. I, I like, uh, I love the opportunity to, well, I love going to places that nobody's ever been before and doing the first exploration. That's really exciting. But, uh, but yeah, there's always places I go back to. And um, for me, it's not all about, you know, deep and edgy stuff. Like, I, I'm going to be really excited to jump in my river as soon as we're out of this like sort of phase one of isolation here because <laughs> because like all of you I've been locked up for about 40 or more days and uh and if I just jump into 10 feet of water I'm going to be thrilled and uh get myself uh away from being rusty <laughs> yeah perfect okay um a couple of Similar questions, but this is one we get all the time and it's hard to answer. If you could sum up all your experiences into one climactic event, what is your most mm. memorable dive? Oh boy, that's really tough. I think, you know, I think some of the dives at Wakala Springs were really important for me. I mean, that was way back in 1997-98, but up until that point, I had been perceived as uh, like like everybody perceived cave divers as adrenaline junkies that were just out to get themselves killed. But after that project, we were regarded as, you know, valuable assets to science as collaborators um, who could be the eyes and the hands of scientists underground in places that they could never reach. So for me, that transformed um, my career and, and really showed me that there was an opportunity here. Um, you know, I'm an artist and, uh, that's my formal background in university, but everything I do requires a lot of, you know, new study in new areas so that I can be a, a, a good collaborator with a scientist. And, um, and that's really, really ex exciting to me. So I'd say that that was pretty momentous. Very cool. Very nice. Um, what is the biggest complication of diving or staying in the Arctic, Antarctic? What was the biggest complication? Well, um, right now in the Arctic, it's getting tougher and tougher. A lot of times we're, we're camping on what we call the flow edge. So that's where the ice meets the open ocean. Every year we have to go earlier because the ice is breaking up earlier. Every year we have to 
sort of set up our camp a little farther from the flow edge because the ice conditions are getting so bad. Um, and so we might be camping in one spot and then traveling, um, you know, 30 or, or more miles to get to the flow edge and we're traveling over, you know, big open ocean cracks and leads um, in sometimes there's deep water on the ice. I've even had deep water in my tent <laughs> um, because it's raining in the summer in the Arctic now. So um, climate change is, is happening so fast in the north and um, it's making conditions really tough. I think there's only going to be really a few more years of feasible um, flow ed diving opportunities. So if you ever want to go there, do it soon. <laughs> Yeah. Very cool. Wow. Next trip for me, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay. Are there any specific gear treatments required if you're going to be diving in areas that have direct lines to drinking water? Oh, that's interesting. Pretty much, you know, whenever I go cave diving, I am swimming in the veins of Mother Earth inside the sustenance of the planet and your drinking water. So there are times where we're even swimming up to the like the bottom of somebody's well pipe. So I've actually seen pipes drilled through the rock into the cave passage, like in a really popular cave in Florida in Little River, there's a well pipe in there. Um, so we don't have any specific um, uh, guidelines for, for doing that, but, but people are drawing up that water wherever we swim. And in Japan, they have um, some sort of pristine mountain water sources where they won't allow any diving at all. They've only once allowed cave diving uh, because they think that we're contaminating it just by our very presence. Um, but there's a lot worse contamination going on than my dry suit. <laughs> so you're not cleaning or doing anything special to your dry suit for drinking nope. those pipes? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Jill, you are truly amazing, clearly blessed to be able to do what you do. Can you describe when you are doing these destinations we've seen, um, do you do the photos or do you have a team of people doing the photos? Can you talk about your training? Uh, so I'm shooting all the photos. That's, that's you know, the root of what I, what I do, still photos and video. Um, I'll have a, a team of people assisting me with lights a lot of the time. So when we're like shooting a movie or something, I might have two or three or even more um, people lighting up the cave um, by my instructions. Uh, for one Hollywood movie, I've been in the water with as many as 18 <laughs> cave divers at once where we're we're filming, we're lighting, we've got people on camera, we've got safety divers, we've got all kinds of logistics happening. Um, but I've also done a lot of stuff solo uh, where I'm shooting and lighting, setting everything up on my own too. Okay, cool. Uh, we, in the pictures, we've seen a lot of side mount, back mount, re back mount rebreathers. Can you mm -hmm. speak to how you decide which time, what are you going to use and how do you decide which mm -hmm. to use? Yeah, um, I'm pretty much either a rebreather or side mount. Um, very rarely do I single tank dive. I just really like the redundancy of side mount, um, but I equally dive side mount open circuit or rebreather. It just depends on, on the purpose. The rebreather buys me range. Every deep dive I do will always be on the rebreather because um, I think I have a lot more options in, in the case of an emergency. Um, shallower dives, I prefer open circuit. Um, and it's certainly logistically uh, really easy to be diving on um, side mounts, like in places when I do exploration in Mexico and you've got to hike stuff through the bush, side mounts, pretty, pretty easy. Sure. And so uh, we had a presentation from Sunto earlier this week, so we know you get to see some of the gear sometimes early. Is there yeah. a technology that you are looking forward to or you're excited about that in gear changes in technology? Mm, I mean, there's a lot of little stuff happening in rebreather technology that's going to improve the safety of, of rebreathers. Solid state sensors, you know, solid state carbon dioxide sensors, things like that are pretty exciting. 
lights have changed more than anything <laughs> in the course of my career. We used to carry these giant, you know, bricks that were so heavy. Um, and now, you know, we have so much more illumination with, with small lights. That's kind of exciting. Um, but I think some of the next stuff is going to be navigation and communication oriented. Um, I think that ultimately, you know, we're going to be carrying like within our computers displays maps and things like that and we're going to have easier and easier ways to communicate with people underwater so i think that's Very nice cool. yeah. yeah communication would be cool mm -hmm. um let's see uh, for your life as an explorer what was the best training course experience either on land or in water that prepared mm -hmm. you for being an explorer uh, it's probably digging in Bobby Pollard's backyard when I was a kid. <laughs> um, I'm pretty much self-taught in, in so many things um, because of the time that I started diving. And I mean, even when I got my first rebreather in the 90s, there were no classes. So when I got the Cislunar Mark V um, shipped to me, uh, I asked Bill Stone, oh, well, okay, you know, who's going to teach me how to use this? And he's like, well, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so so I, today I have uh, teaching you know, credentials for a lot of things that I never had the opportunity to have a class in because the class didn't exist. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it's funny, I almost wish I could backtrack at times and, and, and pick people's brains and at times I have with with colleagues I've said listen okay I, I want to learn this rebreather because I've learned many many different rebreathers over the years I said please just treat me like I know nothing because I want to start from your ground zero and see how you teach so yeah 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 so cool okay uh in your book you talked about gender dynamics and finding yourself in the scuba world how do you balance trusting yourself and your expertise versus listening to others, especially when you're working so closely with the team? Oh, well, um, I mean, teamwork is all about collaboration. And uh, the people that I work with closely are people that I've known for 20 or 30 years. And when, when we're on the hairy edge of exploration and something happens like we get together and we have a meeting and we collaborate and we iron things out so that everybody is comfortable with the decisions that we've made before we move on and do something else. Like in Antarctica, every day something new happened that we could never have possibly imagined. And we would sit down, have a meeting, collaborate, come up with a solution. And, and, and the number one rule in cave diving is that anyone can call the dive at any time for any reason. Um, without issue. And so that's kind of how the meetings happen. And so it really is a, a collaborative um, response. When I'm, I, when I'm on my own, it's just, you know, baby steps, one small step forward, um, just cumulative knowledge. Lots of Very dive. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Um, I think I've got one more. Um, okay, so what is your next big adventure that you're super excited about? Do you have something in the book? <laughs> yeah, I, I had such a busy year on the books and it all went away <laughs> about six weeks okay, ago. <laughs> um, I, yeah, every project of my year has been canceled with the exception of one that I'm hanging on to right now in the hopes that it could potentially happen because it's the end of the summer. Uh, so I'm hoping to get back to Newfoundland on a project uh, where we're going to be diving all around Newfoundland, but also diving on a couple of, of U.S. Navy ships that were sunk during World War II that are pretty significant with a really interesting story behind them. Um, I'm just hoping that we get enough of a summer lull that we're enough on top of the virus that we might be able to to do that and uh because i'm afraid this is going to come back in the fall and we'll be kind of isolated again so it's very uncertain right now for all of us yeah yeah uh we had one last comment where somebody said that um they love the expression you shared of you're scared because you care about the outcome mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say that's our list of questions that we had in the inbox. And I've had mm -hmm. the honor of hearing you speak a couple of times. And um, I truly feel that's true, that you care about the outcome. 
um, because you just come across as so genuine and so ready to explore the world. Um, so um, yeah, there was one more question. Really, oh. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, go yeah. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that's really important. I mean, I've had people say to me, oh, God, you don't want to dive with me. I'm terrified or I'm new or I just learned or whatever. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, if you're just fresh out of your open water class, I'd love to dive with you because because you're fresh right? <laughs> and you're scared. And that means that you care. So um, that's that's yeah. the kind of person I want to that I want to dive with. I don't want to dive yeah. with the chest beater or you know, nothing can go wrong kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I like the authenticity of, of people and I love being in the water yeah. no matter what kind of a dive it is deck wreck or yeah. free dive yeah yeah share the experience I think it's super cool when yeah. you see someone brand new in the water and they come out saying did you see that parrot fish and it's so fun it's to experience amazing. that again through oh, that oh yeah yeah it's just a, yeah. totally totally you know is exciting to me too yeah yeah uh, there was one last question. Do you generally work with the same team? Um, how many safety divers or support divers do you typically work with? And mm. how are people picked for your teams? Yeah, it, it depends. Um, so like I said, there's still a lot of stuff that I do solo. And sometimes that is the safest way for me to do it. I mean, there's a project I'm working on here locally in a cave where it's just not a cave that I could take someone else into. It's dark, high flow, very cold, small, and and so I just go in and I do the documentation work I need to do and I get out. Um, but other times it's a much bigger team. It's not always the same people. There's a lot of core people that I try to always work with, but it seems like every project, there's a few new people that are getting indoctrinated into our clan, <laughs> into our group. And I'm not looking for the very best person with the most, particular dives of a particular skill set. I'm actually looking for someone that um, that I don't mind living with for two months, you know, that's versatile, that's open-minded, um, creative thinker, willing to do anything. Like when I worked in, in um, the Cayman Islands, we would get a hundred resumes a day from dive instructors around the world that wanted to work. And every single resume said, I'm a master scuba diver trainer. I can teach this, 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 and this. But every one of those hundred resumes said that. And so I would dig through their resumes and look for someone who was a plumber or could drive the boat or could fix the boat or was willing to paint the lodge <laughs> or, you know, some kind of an evidence that the person would be willing to do something outside of their comfort zone, willing to learn something new. Those are the people I want to work with. So it's not necessarily the best or the most skilled it's it's someone that i can you know hang out have a coffee with <laughs> and enjoy working together with for a long period of time in difficult situations yeah in uh the comments right now i have someone said i do the dishes someone else said they they would be willing to cook yeah <laughs> absolutely i mean honestly when people say that it's like okay i, I remember <laughs> yeah <laughs> So amazing. Well, I am so grateful for your time tonight. Uh, as I say, I've had the honor of hearing you speak a couple of times and every time I've left it excited about diving and engaged and, um, and very, very excited about what you do. And uh, thank you for joining cool. us tonight. Thanks. Well, it's great to be with you. I hope you guys are all able to get out and back in the water soon. I'm hoping uh, for me too, it won't be too long before they open up our isolation a little bit. Um, yeah. But be safe yeah, in the meantime hoping. and be safe when you get back in the water, take it slow and and uh, enjoy it. That first dive back is going to be like the first dive all over again. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You have a wonderful evening. All right. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.